All right. Hello, everyone. And thank you all for joining us for today's Drexel Alumni Career Services webinar, ChatGBT and AI, Improving Career Prospects and Decision Making with Professor Daniel Albert. My name is Kelly Lowerson, and I am the Director of Alumni Career Services with Drexel's Alumni Relations team. We are thrilled to be able to offer this session today, and I think the response with about 200 registrants shows what a timely and important topic this is. Whether you're a business leader, a job seeker, or simply curious about the future of work, we, will, we hope you will come away from this webinar with a deeper understanding of how AI can help you make smarter decisions at work and advance your career. So a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, as you may have noticed, we are recording this webinar. The recording will be sent to all registrants via email. It will also be posted on Dragon Network, which is Drexel's online professional development community for alumni and students. If you're not already a member of Dragon Network, we encourage you to join. We're going to put the link for Dragon Network in the chat in a moment. Um, we will have time for a brief Q&A at the end of the session, and maybe we'll take some questions throughout. Please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions throughout the presentation. You should see a Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Please don't use the chat box and submit a question directly to Daniel or myself. We're really going to pull questions from the Q&A section. Uh, lastly, following this session, you will all receive an email with a post-event survey asking you what you thought of this session. There is also going to be a question in the survey that asks for your ideas for future alumni career services webinar topics. We really want to make sure that we are providing programming and resources that are relevant to you and will support you in your professional journeys long after graduation. So please let us know what would be helpful. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Arnie Cohen, who is going to introduce today's speaker. For those of you who don't know Arnie, he is our dedicated career counselor for alumni. All alumni, no matter what stage of your career you're in, can meet with Arnie as many times as you would like, free of charge to do a resume review, practice your interview skills, and receive other career strategy support. So I'll post another link in the chat with more information about Arnie. But with that, Arnie, please take it away. Okay. Thank you, Kelly, both for the introduction and for coordinating all the logistics for this webinar. So as Kelly said, I'm a career counselor, career coach exclusive, exclusively for Drexel alumni. And during a lot of my sessions, I have, I have had many career conversations about AI, using ChatGBT, how it works. And I have to say that initially, um, I was unfamiliar, somewhat skeptical about how this AI program is being used by job seekers and career changers. So I first heard Dr. Albert speak at a workshop he gave at a department staff meeting. And I came away much more informed, knowledgeable, and comfortable with AI chat GBT and how it works. And I know you will too. So Dr. Albert is, a, is an assistant professor of management at Drexel, LeBeau College of Business, specializing in strategic management, innovation, organizational design, and human decision-making. He integrates cutting edge technology such as ChatGBT, into his teaching approach, facilitating real-world business scenario analysis for his students. He is also a teaching fellow at LeBeau for implementing generative AI into the curriculum and establishing a student AI fellowship. Dr. Albert's research extends to organizational design in financial services and U.S. hospital industries. He develops computer simulation models to study cognition, complex decision-making innovation, utilizing algorithms informed by psychology and neuroscience studies as effective, simple, simplified representations of human learning processes. Um, so as he talks about chat GBT, get ready to be informed, enlightened, educated, and entertained. So Dr. Albert. All right. Thank you so much, Arnie and Callie, for organizing this. Let me start with like sharing my slides um, so that we can get started. Second, and the camera. We want to get this started. All right. So thank you again, everyone, um, for joining. And we have like a, a great turnout, and I'm very thrilled. Um, to be able to engage with, with the Drexel community, with, with the alums. Um, I wanna do this much more often. I think it's very important that we all stay in touch and learn from each other, uh, especially when, 
when um, industry, science, and um, just the world really is changing so fast. So as Arnie um, mentioned, like I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about the uh, the uh, evolution of AI, and I always have been. But to me, something remarkable happened um, last year when ChatGPT came around. Um, I was a little bit skeptical. I said, like, oh, yeah, I know it, it can talk like a human. And if you ask it some question, it gives something that makes may sound like it makes sense. But it's not going to be as good like as when you really do in-depth research or you, you really uh, push it for, for better answers and so forth. And then I tested it. And um, I was quiet for, for a few moments and thought, like, okay, this changes everything. At that time, I, I said, like, okay, I'm going to change my entire curriculum for teaching um this is going to change the world take this all with a grain of salt like i'm obviously super hyped about this i see great opportunities i see uh challenges and risks that come with it as well but i want to take like a more positive spin on on this today but always take it with a grain of salt and do your own research and and listen to other people especially people like who are critical about it um and don't only listen to people like who are super pumped about it so let me see how I change actually the slide. All right. So just some housekeeping here. Um, there's a couple of terms that we will throw around today. And um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but give you an idea of like what these terms really mean um, and how we will use them today. So everyone has heard the term artificial intelligence, AI. And it's really like the field of studying systems that can make decisions um, and, and perform tasks that usually we associate with human intelligence, right? Machine learning, um, think of it as a method of how these systems learn, right? Like once you have an artificial intelligence system, how do you use new information, new data to further update and learn, right? So there's different methods behind this. And then there's generative AI, um, which is a subfield of AI. And it really means like it generates content. It's trained on human content and it generates novel new content. And so when we talk about generative AI, we talk about text, right? AI chatbots, what we are talking about mostly today. Um, but it also can generate images. It can generate music. It can generate videos. Um, that's all under the umbrella of generative AI. And then specifically, we talk about large language models or LLMs, right? So what do these large language models do? That's really what we talk about today. It's the AI chatbots. They are trained on massive amounts of human written content, right? Like largely from the internet. Um, and they are basically trained to mimic human language patterns. And human language patterns, as we will see later, are also human thinking patterns. And so three chatbots we will talk about a little bit more today is like obviously uh, right here, uh, OpenAI's chat GPT, um, arguably currently the most developed and uh, most popular one. We will talk about uh, Microsoft's Bing search engine, which is powered by chat GPT. And we will talk uh, briefly about Anthropic's Claude um, AI, which is an AI that does something very similar to ChatGPT, but it can read much larger files. So AI is really here to stay. And I guess that's why we're meeting here today and like why you're interested in this topic and you want to learn more about it. So I saw that we have like pretty much like a 50-50 poll um, results where it says uh, either no experience so far, right? I want to learn more or like um, very limited experience. So let me tell you like why we should care about this topic. So GPT-4, the current cutting edge AI chatbot, places 90th percentile in the US bar um, exam, right? So it's basically a lawyer. Um, and it's not because it memorized answers, because it can predict what's the right answer. Um, OpenAI, with its ChatGPT model, has now over 100 million weekly active users, which is a massive growth in just one year. Google, Microsoft Meta, and many other software companies 
um, have made generative AI part of the core strategy very quickly. Um, and for me, like one of the biggest uh, indicators of something is really changing is when we see regulation, right? And so this time, uh, the world doesn't want to miss the boat as we did for the internet, right? Regulating um, certain things like social media. We now see like there was an executive order by the US starting to regulate and um, uh, implementing policies uh, for AI. And the EU just a couple of days ago announced like a, a massive package of um, regulation to come for, for AI. So... AI is already here. Sometimes we might see it in plain sight and sometimes it's a little bit more hidden, but I want to give you a couple of examples. Um, one area that's probably, some people talk about the first casualty of, of uh, generative AI. I would say like the first area that has shifted and really changed is software engineering, programming. Right? Um, because it turns out ChatGPT was trained on human language patterns but as like an unexpected uh, side product, it became really good at producing computer code. So ChatGPT can program and can tell you what's wrong with your program code. If you ask it like, hey, I want to write this in Python or in C++, it gives you the code for it. Right? Um, the graph that you see here is from a website called Stack Overflow. If you're not familiar with Stack Overflow, Stack Overflow is an online community um, of programmers of any level, right? Like from basic beginners to like people like who do nothing else, but like they are hardcore coders. Um, and it's a community where you can ask questions. Say so like, hey, if I'm, I'm stuck with like writing this code, I get this error message, can someone help me? And then it's like a community that for free um, tries to help, posts answers and tries to solve your problems. And so what I plotted here is like the number of um, new questions posted on that website um, a year before the launch of ChatGPT and basically now a year after the launch. And what you see is like we had like in the beginning, like many whoop, over a year, uh, 120,000 uh, questions a month roughly posted. And with a little bit of a delay after uh, ChatGPT was launched, um, it dropped to like 70,000. Right? So people don't go uh, ask other people anymore. They ask ChatGPT to help it with its code. And in a lot of like coding software now, um, ChatGPT is integrated right away. It's changing like how programmers do their work. And like, I program myself for computer simulations, as, as, as Arnie said, it has massively changed the way I approach my work. We see that the big um, office suites like Microsoft 365 and Google have implemented in their enterprise solutions, um, AI, generative AI, so that if you purchase those packages like in Word or Excel, you, you have like um, AI assistance where you can say like, hey, I need a draft for a resume. Um, give me like a first draft and then we start tweaking it with the assistance of AI. And similarly, like there's new business tools that were started th th this year by Salesforce, like how customer relationship management is like enhanced now with, with um, generative AI to tailor outreach to, to clients, to answer emails, to make things more personal, more individualized, and just doing everything at much, much larger scale in, in uh, faster time. And then the area that's obviously a very close to me is science and education. And this is like where we see a massive change. It's maybe not here right away. We see it like fragmented, um, but it's coming. And like, this is one of the few things like where, where, I, where I feel like very positive about it. It it's creates a lot of opportunities, but it is already here. Students already use um, ChatGPT and other um, software. And as I said, like when I realized this, I decided, okay, let's change the curriculum. If this is a tool that students um, who become future employees will use at work, uh, we have 
to make it part of the curriculum. So I made it mandatory in my strategy classes. And of course, like the adoption for classes is of different value depending on what the subject matter is and so forth. Um, but it's already massively changing education. And we have to rethink, how do we test knowledge? How do we test learning? Um, an assignment, like a, writing an essay about summarizing something, that's probably not a good way anymore to measure progress. Um, and it's probably a task that people in the future will not do as often anymore, also um, on the job. So why would we test it in college now? And this, uh, in Nature, one of the leading um, science outlets, they asked a thousand postdocs um, how they do their work. And roughly a third, and that's a couple of months ago already, said like they regularly use ChatGPT and other tools for assistance in writing, their grant applications, their, their papers, for programming, summarizing literature. So it already found its way into research as well. And then last but not least, like that was to me like one of the, the uh, more surprising areas because I always thought like healthcare, like, well, they, they're they probably being more cautious because it's dealing with patients. Um, but it turns out it's actually one of the fastest and most aggressive fields of like embracing AI, not, not at uh, taking on great risk, but like seeing opportunity where it can really assist especially doctors to focus on their patients rather than on a lot of administrative work, right? So virtual nurses uh, help in clinical imaging, note-taking, right? When you jot down your notes, then it automatically populates um, a report that you then only review instead of like typing out everything by yourself. And Epic, one of the largest um, electronic healthcare record companies has already implemented it in its solutions. So really, if you get now from your doctor um, a note personalized to you or something, there's a good chance that it's been done uh, with the assistance of AI. So to me, one of the biggest reasons is like, why is it here to stay? And why will people not go away and say like, hey, it's maybe there's um, too many uncertainties, which there are, and we have to talk about this. But recent studies have shown there's huge benefits in terms of productivity, equality, and quality. So on the left side here on this slide, you see published in Science, again, one of the leading um, scientific journals, a pre-registered online experiment with over 400 professional um, writers. Half of them were using ChatGPT, half of them were not using ChatGPT in the experiment. And they gave them uh, different types of uh, writing uh, tasks and then evaluated them um, in terms of quality. And so the people like who use ChatGPT not only reduced their time to basically finishing their writing by 40%, but also the average quality of those writings went up by 18%. So faster and better quality. But the most interesting part to me is it reduced disparities between levels of skills. So if you think of it like initially, you have writers like that are really good, right? They are here. Um, and then you have people like who are not as good writers that you have them here. So you have like a pretty broad distribution. And so what now the use of GPT does is everyone is moving to the uh, positive side. So everyone is getting better and the distribution gets tighter. So everyone is closer to the mean. Right, um, means the people with the least skills benefit the most from using it. And on the right side, we have a similar study um, that was done with like over 70, 700 um, global consultants from the uh, consulting company, um, Boston Consulting Group. And it's currently a working paper with a, a number of like very talented uh, scholars. And they did tested like different con typical consulting tasks where people use uh, ChatGPT, where they don't use it and where they um, only use ChatGPT, right? So three different versions. And so what they found is like there's many scenarios where a consultant's work is actually done faster and at a higher quality and um, more gets done at the same time. Um, but they also found like a number of tasks and that was not obvious which ta tasks those are, 
where actually like the use with um, ChatGPT led to a huge decline in accuracy, right? Potentially factors of over-reliance on it or like focusing on something that's not that important. Um, but the point is like they talk about a jagged frontier, right? Like there's certain tasks where it's as good or even better than what we humans do. And then there's areas where it's doing much worse. And figuring out which tasks fall into which bucket is not trivial, but very promising them seeing those results. And again, also there they find that the proficiency gap between workers is closed, right? Everyone gets better and the variance between workers gets smaller. So in order to be prepared for this, right? Like, so if you ask like, what can you do to start getting more proficient about this? Um, one part is what's called prompt engineer, right? It's a fancy term for basically say like learning how to craft clear strategic instructions, basically how to interact with the AI in order to get the output you're looking for. And it requires critical thinking, reasoning skills, communication, language skills, but all of, all of these things, what it doesn't need is coding, right? So we are now to, to a point where you interact with uh, the latest uh, technology without programming um, required because programming now becomes natural language. What's, what will not go away, at least for, for a while, is that without expertise in that field, you will not be able to use AI um, appropriately. And think of, of it this way. Assume you get a new uh, research analyst on your team and you want that person like to work on your project. If you just tell them like, oh, here's a task that needs to get done. I have no idea how it would work. Um, and I don't know how to evaluate it because I know nothing about it. When that analyst comes back, how do you know it's good work, right? So that's a problem also with humans. The same with AI. If I ask it about something, um, it gives me an output and I have no idea to know whether this is right or wrong or good or bad, um, it's pretty useless, right? So the expertise or like at least some expertise in the field will be necessary in the future. Um, but finding the right balance, what can you outsource? What do you need to know in order to evaluate that will be critical? And then there's a risk of over-reliance, right? So there's fantastic research been done on showing that once uh, humans work with robots, automation, and um, AI, we tend to slack off at some point, right? Because we over-rely on, on, on the AI, and like that's arguably some of the first uh, crashes with like self-driving cars, where actually like people were still in the car, but humans stopped the human oversight, right? They were on their phone, because at some point they became very comfortable. Hey, let the car drive by itself. It's doing a pretty good job. So the human oversight uh, will be critical, but it's too easy to give in and say like, hey, it's doing a good job. Why should I, why should I uh, be overly cautious? And so a famous case that made it through the news was like when lawyers submitted um, a, an evaluation to a judge citing six uh, law cases that didn't exist because ChatGPT hallucinated them and made them up. So before we dive into like some of the, the practical stuff, I wanna give you like a very high level understanding how do these large language models um, work, right? And I think like a, a general sense is, 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 is good to have. So maybe you have heard like that people liken it to auto completion. That's a good way to start, but it's much, much more, much more difficult and uh, different than that. But it's a good way to start. So think of like someone's typing in the night is. So now the AI tries to predict what's the most probable next word. Could be the night is dark, the night is scary, the night is beautiful, right? And you would say probably like, well, it depends on the context, right? And that's right. So you, you give it different probabilities and that's what, what AI autocompletes. So how was it trained? You give it basically all that's ever been written on earth. That's a little bit exaggerated, but everything that we have digital more or less, um, and AI reads it multiple times. And what it does is it reads the first couple of words 
and tries to predict what's the next word. It reads the night is and says like, I think it should be dark. And then it turns out, oh, it's beautiful. Then it says like, oh, I was wrong. And so now it tries to adjust its rules of predicting, right? We call this weights, um, predictive weights of which there's trillions in chat GPT that all help basically calculate what's the most likely given everything that I know came before. And so it learns and it tries to predict like what's next in, the, in those texts that it's reading online. Um, and what it does learn over time is developing rules in which context should what kind of work, uh, word follow um, a specific other word. And that's really the reason why you see that when you type something in into ChatGPT, that it doesn't give you just like a big block of text, but it's really producing word by word, right? And it's going through the math and say like, okay, based on this, like the next word is this. And so the revolutionary part was really that it's these G GPT models, which are generative pre-trained transformers. And transformers is really like a new development in neural networks that allows the AI to understand context. Imagine you have a hundred words in front of you, right? When you read through this, you probably pay attention to a couple of um, phrases or uh, context specific terms. And that's basically what AI can do with transformers. It transforms like all these words into like a matrix where it says like these things are associated and this matters more than these other words. And based on that, it makes its prediction what should follow. And so you see context is very important and context is basically everything you type in to instruct ChatGPT, but also every word that it then starts writing builds the context for the next words. So what do we use it for? Um, automation in the past has always been like for manufacturing work or like, um, uh, very standardized work uh, where, where robots could be placed and so forth. But with AI, it's the first debate where we say like a lot of like human decision-making processes might be augmented or even replaced by AI. And so why is this potentially possible? Well, a couple of years ago, we thought like AI will be good at a lot of things, but probably not creativity. And it turns out, man, we were really wrong about this. So if, depending on how you think about creativity, but the literature sees creativity along three dimensions, right? It says creativity is how many ideas you generate. Creativity is how good those ideas are. And creativity is like whether there are exceptional ideas in there, right? And you can measure all three of those dimensions. And in a study with MBAs, they found AI is better on all three compared to MBA students. And that's pretty impressive if you think like, okay, more ideas, that makes sense, right? It's a machine, but better quality and more exceptional ideas, that's pretty um, radical. And in Nature Magazine, they, they just recently talked about this um, in certain industries like pharma and other areas like uh, chemistry research, um, they already use it for hypothesis generation, right? So what should we text ne uh, test next? What, what kind of like protein unfolding mechanism should we uh, test next? Um, it predicts th those, those hypotheses. But it turns out it doesn't only predict the things that humans would come up with, but it also comes up with predictions that are very different from how we think, right? And so... Science sees a big potential there to say, we can see hidden blind spot ideas that otherwise we didn't have on our radar. And to me personally, um, I think AI is a massive uh, tool for decision-making, tackling our own biases. Right? Let's say I want to buy a new car and like I'm deciding between two cars and one is like much more expensive, has an overpowered engine and everything top of the line, but actually it's way too much what, what, what I need. 
but I'm really start thinking like, oh, it's really a better car because it holds its value better. Um, and it, it looks nicer. I will enjoy it. And it's better for going on vacation and, and so forth. But we call this a confirmation bias, right? Like I already made my decision. Like I want this car and I'm not taking in any um, information that would prove me wrong or like actually say like, hey, the other car is actually better for, for the long run for you. And so what I can do now is I, I tell AI, um, hey, take the role of devil's advocate. Like I want to buy these um, one of those two cars. Here's my budget. Um, here's why it's important to me. Um, I think really I want to go with this car, but I want you to take a harsh devil's advocate who challenges my my uh, arguments and comes up with counter arguments, right? And then in the end, you might still say like, well, I still want to have the nice car, but at least then you know um, why you're doing it and you're aware of all these other points. Now, imagine you're working on a project um, that you want to pitch to your team, doing this exercise at home just to see like, hey, what are the, the first five, six, seven critical comments that AI comes up with, like you can say like, hey, take the role of the CFO and take the role of the marketing person. It says like, oh, the customers never want this project. Um, you prepare, right? You prepare and maybe improve your project. And you go to your team with a much, much, much more thought through idea. And the nice thing, at least for me, is like it's psychological safety, right? It's To me, it's less embarrassing to be criticized by a machine. But I don't particularly like it to be criticized by people I like. And God forbid, I really don't like to be criticized by people I don't like. Right? Um, and they might be biased as well. But having said that, AI is not free of biases. And I, I'm aware that many of you have brought up um, this point as well. So AI, we don't really know much about it right now, how it works. Even the people like who train these models. AI is largely a black box. Um, it hallucinates, right? So it's getting better with newer models, but it still can make up things and sound very convincing that are not true. Um, and then there's something called emergent behaviors that can, that can be incredibly um, exciting and incredibly scary. Emergent behaviors means abilities in these models that were not intended, right? So one example is, for instance, like these large language models were trained to be communicative and talk human patterns, um, no one expected that they can do math and no one expected that they can program. And there's many other things that they can do. And we start getting an idea of all the other things that it started learning um, that it was never specifically trained to do. Right? But that can also have negative uh, consequences where we need to put guardrails on it. And in order to get like good answers, um, we need to set context. Right? And so this is where, where I want to give you like a little bit of like a um, demonstration. Um, I need to change my screen here for a moment. Okay. So what I'm doing now is like I'll go to ChatGPT to the website that you um, may or may not be familiar with. Um, so it's really OpenAI's website, chatopenai.com. I made an account. Um, there's a free version uh, and there's a premium version. I'm using the, the premium version. Um, I will talk about this a little bit later, uh, which I think is like very valuable. But now let me... Real quick, get my prompts. So imagine you want to get some advice and you say like, hey, I want to invest $10,000 for the long run. How should I invest? You put this in and it will give you a pretty generic answer. Right? And it says like, hey, it depends on your risk tolerance, on your goals. Think about diversification. Hey, an ETF might be good. Um, retirement accounts. Like, it's it's basically like I get a very similar result if I say 
in Google, hey, how to invest for the long run, right? So there's not much uh, that we wouldn't get online. But now, what I mean by context setting is before I start, hey, tell me what to do with $10,000 to invest for the long run, I write a prompt something like this. Assume the role of a seasoned financial advisor based in the US with particular expertise in long-term investing for different levels of risk appetite. Your advice is always tailored to your client and you refrain from cookie cutter advice. That's at the end of the day, your value proposition to the client and you are proud of it. A particular gift of yours is to ask direct and tailored questions to the client, but never overload them with questions. You ask one question at a time, very direct and not assuming the client is particularly familiar with investing. But don't assume they are ignorant either. If you need more information from the client, you ask very direct questions that help you arrive at the best possible advice you can give. Please wait for my first question and say nothing before. So I start with this now um, and ask it the same question that we asked before. Say like, hey, I wanna invest $10,000 for, for the long run. How should I do this? And now it asks me concrete questions, right? Are you comfortable? What is your comfortable level of risk, right? Um, lower risk, or higher risk. So like, um, I like high risk over the next 10 years. After that, I don't know. Right. And so now it gives me like different options, right? And you could go back and forth and say like, uh, ask, have it ask more questions, right? Like now it asks me about what, it, what I know about ETFs and what potential risk factors I would um, factor in. But the point is by setting a context and that's uh, basically uh, prompt engineering 101, telling the AI somewhat of a context what's setting the stage, right? Um, and why this is helpful is think back to like predicting words, right? When I, when I told you like how it predicts words um, into the future, um, with this context, it moves basically to a different word cloud of terms, concepts that are related, right? Now it's like much more in the, oh, financial advisor. I got to be careful what I ask here. Like I got to be more mindful about the questions instead of saying, hey, what's a general um, investment strategy? So that's what, what, what we mean by context setting. Let me close this. learning how to learn, um, also in conversations with employers uh, to see like, hey, what do you expect from, from future graduates? Like what, what skills do they need? And it's not so much, um, hey, they need to be super tech savvy or something, but they need to be able to figure out these, these tools. And a lot of them are really communication based. So as you saw, like I was just typing things in a chat and like you can do it also with your voice. Um, AI can talk to you back. It becomes much more conversational instead of um, programming tech heavy. So for career building, um, in a simplified form, if we think about like, hey, learning education, we search a network for jobs, we apply for jobs, uh, we interview, and hopefully we get an offer, and then we start learning all over again, there's different ways where AI comes in. Right? So education is beyond like uh, formal education, online resources, taking classes on uh, on this, and like um, on, prompt engineering, et cetera, like to continue learning. Because what one thing that beca becomes clear is that this becomes a 
distinguishable skill set in so far to say, how familiar are you with, with instructing AI? Can you in, implement this into your workflow? And currently, this is really like a, a feature that can distinguish applicants on the market. And like for self-employed people, like also I can just give you like an incredible um, uh, productivity boost. For search, there's like more and more websites like Azuna, like AI powered uh, websites that help you search for jobs more de um, aligned with, with your actual qualifications. Um, and they offer tools that uh, basically give you mock interviews using AI tailored to um, this particular job. And you can go through different levels of, of difficulty. Um, and it's very impressive. Like their, their tool is called Prepper and is for free, uh, very useful tools. One thing that I wanna stress is like for the application process. And this is like where Arnie uh, and I had a discussion about is like, is the cover letter for applications, is it dead, yes or no? Um, and at this point, we don't know, but employers are still requesting it, but people in increasingly use it more to polish their CV, polish their, their application letters. Um, so far, if you send an, uh, uh, your, your application to a company, there's two scenarios, right, oftentimes. Uh, one is like, it's completely automated and AI screens um, to a subsample of applications. The other case is like humans sort it, but there's evidence that on average, they look six seconds at a CV, right? And so now the question is like, are you more comfortable with the AI bias or like the six second bias by a human? Um, so the question is like, how to stand out, how to polish it. Uh, and AI can really augment and help you like tailor it. Like, hey, what do you, I want to highlight in my resume given this job uh, description, this job posting here. But what you don't want to do is have it write everything because like recruiters oftentimes can smell if it was like written by AI because it's like just a specific form, very polite, like very elaborate. Um, and that can really backfire in the application process. For interviews, um, as I mentioned, there's tools now where you can go through mock interviews that are tailored to, to your CV and to the um, job posting um, where basically AI assumes a role. I will showcase this in a second. And the same thing for negotiations, right? Like there's even tools out there for negotiator where you, you go through, hey, this is the offer that I got. This is the company, um, role play with me um how i should uh, uh, approach this negotiation right and a good negotiation coach ai negotiation coach asks you first like what are your priorities what are the things like where you would say like okay if this is met i i want to sign and then helps you like develop a strategy and you can play it through right like just to see what are some questions that might throw you off all right so let's let's do another um demonstration here. I, let's say I decided I want to change careers. Um, I'm done with academia. And as always, we start with a context um, prompt. I, I tell AI, you are my career coach and you have known me for years. You're very honest with me and don't sugarcoat things if I have a bad idea. When you talk, your sentences are always short and begin with, well, interesting, let me see. That's just like a little quirk that I like um, my, my uh, coach to have. Um, I'm approaching you with a question regarding a career change. Specifically, I'm considering applying for a performing art position at Cirque du Soleil as a clown. Here's the posting. So I did have a Cirque du Soleil posting somewhere. Where is it? Cirque du Soleil clown job posting. Oh, there it is. 
Now, here they have like some information on that position. And here it is. So I give it the job posting. And ask it further to analyze this basically with this prompt, say, be honest and make two arguments why my previous career may help with this, how val valuable you think anyone in that industry will think that is, be realistic, and two reasons why this may be a challenge, could I talk myself out of it? Okay, so well, let, interesting, let me see. Potential advantages, my innovation skills coming handy as a, as a clown, um, cognition for the psychology and, and performing. Lack of industry specific experience, that's quite honest and, uh, and true. Okay, so here's like the transitioning skills and knowledge some of your skills are transferable, the challenge lies in effectively applying them. So it basically gives me an overview. And obviously this is like a, a little bit of like a funny example, but just to get this to the next level, I say like, okay, let's do some role playing here. Now assume the role of the circus owner who is a harsh and direct person. This person is very direct in their language and blunt, but always has a point that is somewhat embellished with cynicism and humor. Please interview me. You are absolutely against hiring me, but your investor asked to do them a favor and talk to me. Always ask me one question at a time. And so now you see like, this is like the idea behind it. Like you have now a coach, whatever role you want them to basically think about this. Like how would, what could possibly come up uh, during an interview? And so, the circus owner says, all right, let's get this over with. First question, you're an academic, right? So tell me, how do you plan to swap your cozy office and fancy lectures for the gritty, unpredictable world of circus performance? And please spare me with theoretical, or theoretical jargon. Let's hear the real deal. And I will say like, I think teaching prepared me well and I can be funny using social science what do you think oh teaching and being funny with social science huh that's a new one tell me how do you plan to make an audience laugh and stay engaged with social science i mean it's not exactly what you call a rip tickler is it and so so you get the idea and now you can think of like many other scenarios where you can use this, where you say like, hey, what could be questions that are supposed to throw me off guard? What are questions um, that are highly unusual? Like uh, what are questions that uh, are specific to my CV or like gaps in my CV that a harsh person might ask or someone who's favorable of my applications but need a, needs a clarification. So you can really scenario play through different things. So we're well, we're running low on time. Um, other use cases I, I will just mention to you um, in the interest of time, not going into it. But a, a very classic use case is TLDR, right? Too long, didn't read. All of us, I think, like have like this little folder or in our notes app, like a list of like, oh, this Wall Street Journal article or this New York Times article, I really would like to read. And in the end, we don't, right? And so what's uh, what's possible now is basically to say, summarize it for me and give me like the three, four key insights related to my class or related to my job, right? And you define this once and you 
you use this prompt over and over again, and you get for a lot of articles that you otherwise realistically never would read, you get an overview. Is it perfect? Probably not, but it's better than not having read these articles at all. Using it for brainstorming. Again, like yesterday, um, knowing I would run out of time, uh, I ran like an experiment where I said like, hey, develop some business ideas for Drexel campus that should be costing less than $50 um, and are tied to, to Drexel for a physical product that's truly novel. And basically I asked it to de de design the project uh, product and give me an image what it could look like for an investor. Okay, so I'm not doing the live demonstration, but it came up with like Dragon's Delight, a Drexel culinary journey. So this image was generated, by the way, all images in this presentation were generated by AI. Um, so it came up with like, hey, a Drexel um, cooking book where alums and students share their favorite dishes. And it's a nice and high quality print with heartwarming stories from the Drexel community. Right? Another example I gave was experience Drexel like never before with our uh, augmented reality calendar. Right? So it's a physical calendar that can be scanned with your app and augment your, your, your calendar and like get additional information um, and scan dates, historic tales about Drexel and so forth. Again, all of this, like the entire business idea and these pictures generated by AI with a few keystrokes. So in closing remarks, and I apologize for rushing through this, you can see like there's so many more things that I would love to talk with with you about. Um, so this is really only a teaser um, and I would love to get more, more um, discussions on this. If you have personal opinions of, of mine that, that, that I see um, at this point where we are, uh, ethics and privacy, it's a big concern. And I don't have an answer to this. Like, this is something that we have, as societies have to figure out, right? Through regulations, what we want to see in those companies, how we want to hold whom accountable for this um, to, to be safe. This is like a matter that we have to address also in our organizations, right? You shouldn't use um, AI or, or uh, private data without consulting with, with your company, right? Um, however, many of those issues are being uh, solved first because like that's what they those companies see like oh a lot of companies are talking about privacy so open ai has enterprise solutions now that are soc2 um, compliant which is a very high standard um uh, in, in in the financial ac accounting industry um that's really as good as it gets in comparison to like cloud computing or any other technology we're using where there's a risk of privacy leaks there will be a risk of privacy leaks in AI, but we have the same standards as anywhere else. Like So this is in parts higher than HIPAA, right? Um, and you see, even in healthcare is adopting these, these technologies. I think it's very important to destigmatize AI, right? Um, many of those images in my presentation were created um, with the help of AI. Many of the bullet points like, where I said, like, how can I phrase this more clearly? I used AI for this, right? It helped me and was a, a sparring partner and like in coming up with an outline. Um, sometimes when you tell people, they say like, oh, that's that's not uh, genuine. But no one would these days say like, wait, you used a pocket calculator to calculate um, the tip for the restaurant or you used Word to write your resume. Um, no one would hold this um, against you these days, but AI is somewhat um, stigmatized still. And that leads to people using it without saying it. And I think that's more dangerous than using it, but being transparent about it. AI can make a great tutor. It can teach you new skills. It can help you bridge proficiency gaps to reach something else. If you cannot code, but you would want to have a website, you now can do this with the help of AI, right? It can teach you like the basics of it and, and um, walk you step by step through for you to have a, a, um, a website, maybe even an app without the need that you are a coder. I think this is incredibly liberating. Um, and being curious, like I'm, I'm in the middle of the, the thing, being curious about the potential and seeing what, what opportunities we have ahead of us, uh, I think that's 
the way to go um, in order to stay engaged with this topic. We share those slides. Here I have an overview of the most popular um, uh, models. Most of you have tried this one, the free ChatGPT 3.5. And it's, it's a great tool, but what I showed you and like the capabilities of like more cutting edge, like GPT-4 or Claude 2.1 is ChatGPT on steroids. So if you had an experience like, oh, it's not that good as I expected, try the premium one, which currently has a wait list, um, but there is a difference like day and night. I'm not compensated by any of those. Like I'm not sponsored in any ways, but it really, if for a lot of workflows makes sense to pay for this. And I apologize that it ran so long. Um, thank you so much. Stay, in con uh, stay connected is my LinkedIn um, QR code. I would love to hear how you use it. If you have other questions, I know we do an exit poll of like what you would like to see next, um, what what questions you might have. And I'm, if we can't answer any questions now, like I'm happy to uh, reach out or send, um, if you send me an email or like in LinkedIn, like I'm happy to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Albert. This was so interesting and you did such a good job answering the questions that we're submitting as you went along. So I really think we covered most everything. Um, there were a lot of questions about how to stay relevant, how to stay up to date. And that really ties into this last poll. We're hoping that you'll all answer on your way out. Um, this is obviously a topic that we could have spent more than an hour on today. We wanna see if there's interest. Should we host more sessions on this topic? Do a deeper dive into certain areas of it? Um, so this is just a quick poll. And then again, there will be an email survey where you can write in even more feedback. You're welcome to email me. You're welcome to email Dr. Albert. Um, this is obviously an important topic and we wanna make sure our Drexel alumni are informed and well-equipped in, in this changing work environment. So huge thank you for all participating. Again, thank you to Dr. Albert and we'll see you at our next Alumni Career Services webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly.